right, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to everybody. Uh, we have uh, a relatively small but very select group of people here who are passionately interested in the issues that we're discussing today and uh, who are trying to do something huh, about them. Bruno Milanese, unfortunately, will not be here, but uh, there's a message huh, that he has sent, and perhaps I should begin with the message from Bruno. He uh, has been uh, uh, following, well, he was in Canada huh, for a number of conferences that were also attended by Judith, huh, uh, but he works uh, at a university in Brazil. It's addressed to dear friends in Canada. In the midst of a turbulent and complex conjuncture here in Brazil, the movement of people affected by DAMS, M-A-B for short, is organizing a march and several activities with those affected by the biggest social environmental crime in Brazil. This crime was the rupture of the tailings dam at San Marcos mine in Mariana, jointly owned by Vale and BHP. And that took place on November 5th, 2015. So we are at in a, uh, anniversary days uh, of that disaster. The tailings have contaminated more than 43 municipalities along the Rio Doce basin in the state of Minas Gerais reaching the Atlantic Ocean in the state of Espirito Santo. The toxic tsunami along the 650 kilometer Rio Doce destroyed many houses, goods, ways of life, sources of income, dreams, and life projects. Until now, the justice system in Brazil has given no real answer. The criminal actions by the mining corporations have remained unpunished. No new houses have been built for those who lost their homes. Thousands of affected people are not recognized officially as eligible for compensation. The Renova Foundation, a private foundation created in 2016 and financed by the perpetrators of the crime, that is uh, by Vale and BHP, the Renova Foundation dabbles with the problems without really organizing solutions for the affected population. Three central problems are being netted along the entire basin, the Rio Doce Basin and the coastline. One, the recognition of women as affected by the disaster. Second, the issue of health and risk of contamination. And third, the recognition that the ocean itself has been affected by toxic tailings. Between the days of November 4th and November 14th, we will march for our rights. Our march will begin with our encounter of women and children affected, giving visibility to gender inequality within the process of compensation and reconstruction and together building an agenda with the women affected uh, to denounce the crime uh, uh, against the Rio Doce, the re entire region. And the following, during the following days, we will continue to march throughout the cities and communities that were affected by the disaster, engaging in dialogue with the people about this moment in our country's history, both denouncing as well as publicizing the demands of the people that were affected. We need your solidarity and your help in giving vis visibility to our struggle of resistance in defense of our rights. Those who wish to send messages of support, please send them to MAB. We will read them during our march. That's M-A-B at M-A-B, Nacional, N-A-C-I-O-N-A-L, dot org, dot B-R, for Brazil. Now, we will leave this huh, you know, on the table or put it there uh, on the side. Huh, if you want to check huh, the email and make sure huh, that you do send a message. Okay, so now we get to Judith. Uh, Judith Marshall 
um, is not simply her, uh, the author of her, the work on what happened at Mount, pa Mount Pali and also of what happened in Mariana in Brazil, but she also belongs to a network that monitors uh, Vale Corporation, the Brazilian corporation that purchased uh, the mines uh, in Sudbury, what was it, 10 years ago and uh, 12 years ago, and proceeded uh, to break the union, you know, and uh, make uh, some uh, uh, very, very terrible changes in the operations. Uh, Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for giving me that extra time. I think sometimes that my friends and family just wish she'd shut up this rant about mining and tailings dams and... Anyway, it's something that I got very close to because of involvement in that network of people affected by Valley. I had been working in the steelworkers for many years and uh, the steelworkers were an early member of that network. When I retired, I um, changed hats and with an association at CERLAC, um, I continued to be part of that network. So in the first anniversary of that spill at Mariana, I was part of a group that joined a caravan at the place where the spill reached the Atlantic Ocean. Um, we traveled by bus, stopping at various communities along this 650 kilometer river system that was affected by the spill, planting trees in different communities, holding commemorative events. Uh, when we finally got to Mariana, uh, we did the same thing that they're doing this week, uh, which is to, amongst other things, carry out events with 19 crosses for the 19 people who lost their lives in that spill in the very nearby communities to, to the mine. So Mariana was close to my heart because of all of that and at some point uh, I was contacted by people from Idle No More saying that in Canada there had been a spill um, not as big as the, Mount, the Mariana spill but for those in the epicenter of it, just as dramatic, just as devastating. And they knew that there'd been an, this massive spill in Brazil the year late after, and so uh, wanted some connections. Um, I was very happy to play that role, but began to think about Mount Pauli and what I knew about it, and it was almost zero. Uh, you know, a blip in the media in Canada in the August day that it happened, um, in 2014 and very little about it uh, after that um, so I began to delve into it and the more I read about it the more I was just literally gobsmacked by how similar the situation was the kinds of circumstances leading up to the spills and the kinds of responses from government uh, from the mining companies and from local communities and social movements afterwards. And so out of that came the idea of writing this comparative study, the, the thick version that uh, came out in August, uh, published in British Columbia by the CCPA, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, and the Corporate Mapping Project um, now exists in hard form and you can easily uh, get it online if you're interested and download it. But it was delving into these two very dramatic events. The one in Mount Pauli in 2014 resulted in 24 million cubic meters of toxic muck spilled into glacial lakes, uh, beautiful British Columbia forests. Um, Bruno and I were both there recently because we did a kind of promotional tour for the study in British Columbia um, at the end of September and the beginning of October. And then in, in less than a year later, this spill in Mariana where 60 million cubic meters of toxic muck uh, were suddenly spewed out. Um, no warning signs in the nearby communities. Uh, people improvising ways on their cell phones or getting on their motorbikes to warn neighbors to that the dam had uh, breached. Um, 
and this toxic tsunami that made its way along the Rio Doce River system and just entirely destroying that river basin, uh, indigenous communities affected along the way, but just all kinds of activities. I mean, think of a 600 kilometer river system uh, in, in, uh, and the numbers of people, goods, fields, uh, homes affected. So um, a huge impact. And in the study, I, I identified 10 different similarities in circumstances in the two countries. Um, I won't certainly take the time to go into every one of them in detail, but just to give you a sense, they're of, of different um, orders. Uh, I guess the first three are really uh, generic to mining, things that are happening in mining globally at this moment in history. So, I mean, one of these is that uh, mining today, the sort of low-lying fruits, the, the richest ores, the most accessible deposits have pretty much been mined. So we're at an era in mining when uh, lower-valued ore bodies and less accessible ore bodies are being mined. New te technologies make that possible and depending on the price and global com commodity markets, mining companies do or do not pursue those kinds of of uh, ore bodies. But the thing about them is that mining just in and of itself generates a very major waste stream. I mean, of rock, of water, of contamin con contaminated uh, components, tailings, uh, waters, uh, liquids. And so once the marketable component has been extracted, uh, a mining company has a huge job in terms of dealing with its tailings. And uh, these tailings, now toxic, need careful storage, not just during the lifetime of the mine, uh, but at closure and into perpetuity. Um, so another just statistic from that is that these new mineral extraction processes leave behind 8 to 10 percent more waste than earlier methods. So that's just happening at Mount Pauly, at Mariana, in mines everywhere. Um, the second similarity is that the mining companies' ways of dealing with this toxic storage waste are highly problematic. Um, many of them use wet storage methods, so are stacking this toxic material behind earth and rock embankments. Uh, there are dry storage methods that are much safer, cost more. Um, few mining companies actually use them. Uh, the expert study down, done on Mount Pauly after the spill um, talked a lot about best available technologies, best available practices, and certainly dry storage is one of them. But one of the problems is that when one talks of best, does best mean safest or does best, best mean cheapest? And unfortunately, the mining companies pretty much gravitate towards the latter. Um, the independent experts panel, this was one of the quotes from them that I found interesting. Tailing stamps are complex systems that have evolved over the years. They are also unforgiving systems in terms of the number of things that have to go right. Their reliability is contingent on consistently flawless execution in planning, in subsurface in surface investigation, in analysis and design, in construction quality, in operational diligence, in monitoring, in regulatory actions, and in risk management at every level. All of these activities are subject to human error. And if you track what happened at Mount Pauly and, Mar and Mariana, every one of those points that needed um, flawless execution had huge flaws, and hence the two tragedies. The third area that is similar to mining everywhere um, is that the boom-bust cycles in the commodity market have a huge influence on what mining companies do. And 
as many of you know, there was a super cycle between about 2003 and 2013 when prices for minerals were just going up and up and up. So in these boom periods, mining companies hustled uh, with aggressive pushes to relax licensing pr procedures and uh, insist on more self-regulation, all in a rush to uh, avail themselves of these high prices. Um, in Brazil, for example, um, a fourth uh, pellet plan for iron pellets was launched in the year of the spill that resulted in a 37% production increase. But no changes in the storage facilities, the size of the tailing stem that could accommodate this increased production. So big problems there. Um, and then with prices plummeting again, companies intent on trying to keep profit levels up uh, did things like laying off, postponing maintenance, uh, reducing inspections. So when you really track what happened in the two places, uh, both the boom and the bust resulting in things that made, uh, that created the potential for the kind of catastrophic events that actually happened. And this is all over the world. This intensified production leads to more tailings waste and to many tailings ponds being filled beyond their engineered capacity. So all th those three were things that in every month, I mean, for anyone who is close to this world of mining, these two breached. But it sets any thoughtful person thinking about how many mines are out there operating with tailing stamps just waiting for an accident like this to happen. Because in neither case was it a natural phenomenon. In neither case was there one singular event that made it happen. It was a chain of circumstances that have to do with how mining is done or not done, how regulation is carried out or not carried out in, in the mining sector. So looking at some of the more specific things that, that happened, um, prior warnings unheeded. In neither case were these events things that just came from nowhere. Uh, there were warnings that there were problems. In Van the Vancouver Sun in 2010, uh, four years before the Mount Pauly um, uh, breach, there was a story that about reports on the Mount Pauly mine that had identified very serious security concerns. Nobody took heed of this. Uh, still a huge push from the mining company for self-regulation, um, diminished numbers of inspections. Um, the workers in the mine themselves were concerned about it. There was a, a the Steelworkers Union represented the workers in the Mount Pauly mine and one of them I was interviewed later and said, I phoned the Ministry of Mines and told them the dam was pushed out. A lot of employees knew the dam was going to give. I told them they've got to do something about this. It's going to breach. It's a disaster waiting to happen. It all fell on deaf ears. So there were warnings. Um, in Mariana in 2014, um, a San, Marco, um, San Marco was alerted to the risk of rupturing uh, after an engineering inspection. Uh, in the court cases that have ensued afterwards, in the documents that have come out, um, many Samarco board meetings, when problems with the Fundau Man my, uh, tailing stand were on the agenda and what to do about it, but always a push to keep costs down, keep costs down as uh, the other standard item on the agenda. Um, there was, in these court proceedings afterwards, even the revelation that um, San Marco had commissioned a study, a worst case scenario study of what would happen if there was a spill there. And it was very accurate. I think they estimated 20 people might die, only 19 did. Uh, they also estimated the huge cost, the huge damage to the environment. So it's not that these things were unthinkable or unknowable, they just, that nobody was taking responsibility for them and that, that worst case scenario actually happened. Another similarity was that when they happened, the companies just downplayed the gravity of the situations. I mean, there's statements, quotations from the Mount Pauly president 
say, saying the day after the spill, I drink the water. Uh, and yet the um, data that a mining company has to file in terms of, of uh, toxics that it's uh, are part of its production process showed huge quantities of highly uh, toxic ma materials that were in the water in that tailings dam. Uh, in Mariana, the company claimed it was an isolated incident beyond our control, the muck was not toxic, and yet tests a week later identified very high levels of arsenic, lead, barium, copper, and mercury. Uh, interestingly, uh, one of the little tricks in all this was that, that the Wall Street Journal uh, outed was that um, Valet and BHP Billiton uh, worked very hard to distance themselves from this tragedy and claimed that, uh, no, no, this was, uh, the, the Mariana made, management made all decisions about what went on in the Mariana mine, uh, that it was not about Valet and BHP. And, and the journalists in the Wall Street um, Journal were having none of it, saying that this was interesting to see these big mining companies uh, carrying forward this argument, but it was quite evident in Brazil that they were going to be uh, right behind uh, the eight ball in terms of, of uh, their responsibility for this. Um, but that, that Another real irony in Brazil was that the first time that the state governor spoke about the spill uh, in Minas Gerais state, which is a state that has many, many mining companies and historically is a major mining state. So the, the, the state governor's first statement about this catastrophic event was made from the Samarco headquarters and this was not lost on the citizens of the state, the inappropriateness of the company, uh, of their state governor immediately aligning himself with the mining company and its interests. Um, other things that were very similar in, in, in all of this um, and, and are very much, uh, were, the, were the complete, um, was the complete lack of disaster preparedness. Uh, in neither country uh, were communities or workers uh, ever alerted to the potential of these kinds of disasters. Um, in Mariana, there had been at one point a, a conditionality on the state licensing of the mine and, and the condition was that they must include a warning system and emergency evacuation plans and drills. And Mar San Marco had commissioned a full emergency plan in 2009, but then with the economy worsening, they just filed it in a drawer somewhere. Similarly, in Mount Polly, there had been studies, a study done uh, a couple of years before when uh, a, a controlled um, uh, discharge was being requested by the mining company. And the study done on that by an independent researcher also included a strong recommendation of emergency plans for the nearby communities. But again, none of that was actually put in place. So these are last three things were specific circumstances that were very similar in both cases. Um, but the sort of broader frame in which they fit is this whole theme of regulatory capture. Um, the simplest but perhaps most alarming definition of it that I've come across is that regulatory capture is a form of government failure which occurs when a regulatory agency created to act in the public interest instead advances the commercial or political concerns of special interest groups that dominate the industry or sector it is charged with regulating. The former liberal government in British Columbia was a phenomenal friend of the mining industry. And uh, the British Columbia Auditor General um, in, 19, in 2016, the year after the, the spill, um, was concerned with the shifting prices of, on the commodity markets and concerned to ensure that environment was still being adequately protected in British Columbia. So therefore launched an audit 
And when the Mount Pauli spill happened, she applied a microscope to everything that had gone on at Mount Pauli. And it would be hard to find language harsher than the language she used in her report, absolutely indicting the British Columbia government for the role it had played in terms of laxness in any kind of regulatory role. Um, she identified a central conflict of interest that the same government body was responsible for promoting mining and regulating mining and that these were two very different operations. So uh, said that the Ministry of Mines was, she actually said that the Ministry of Energy and Mines is at risk of regulatory capture primarily because its mandate includes a responsibility to both promote and regulate mining. And so she urged strongly uh, an independent regulatory body. <clears throat> Unfortunately, although the NDP and Green parties were all over the ills of the Liberal government in terms of what it was doing and, it, and the, the reality of regulatory capture. Uh, but that central recommendation they have not even mentioned now that they're in power. So uh, the incredible capacity of mining companies, and we could say oil companies, and we could say corporations more broadly, to capture governments um, and <coughs> push for situations in which governments cease to regulate and instead service the interests of the corporations. I think this is the kind of world we live in now, and this is the theme that I really uh, have been trying very hard in this study to, to bring to the forefront. Just as part and parcel of, of um, the regulatory capture, and this is the part that really interested the Brazilians. I, I was there last year and uh, gave a couple of seminars in, in uh, two of the universities in Brazil. And the part that totally fascinated the Brazilians was the fact that the BC Auditor General was saying that in British Columbia, regulatory capture was happening. A government had been bought. And the Brazilians were feeling that that only happened in Brazil. How could it be happening in a jurisdiction like Canada? But all the evidence in BC is, is, is right there. In fact, the New York Times did an article calling British Columbia the Wild West of Canadian political uh, contributions. So massive corporate contributions to the political campaigns in the two jurisdictions. and. Uh, incessant lobbying, intensive lobbying, uh, to get the mining narrative, the mining point of view established as, as the only reality. So that again, a similarity of circumstances. Um, another whole chapter um, is the role of, of the impact of these mines on indigenous land and on land of slave descendants. Um, there was an important community along the Rio Doce of Krenak people who were very seriously affected uh, and others closer, closer to, to the Atlantic uh, Ocean. So, I mean, the neoliberal orientation of the governments, this is really the crux of the matter. And I want to take you on a little trip with me. Um, it's in a spaceship and we're with executives from mining companies and we're looking down at Mother Earth and just trying to imagine what they might be seeing. So maybe they would be marveling at tailing stamps because apparently the, the size of these man-made structures is phenomenal and quite visible uh, when you look down at Earth from a spaceship. Perhaps they'd be focusing on the ore bodies yet to be extracted and what grade of ore they contained. Um, they might be musing on accessibility to these ore bodies and what combination of roads, rivers, railways, pipelines, offshore platforms and ports would be needed to carry ore from these new mines to global commodity markets. I think we can be sure that they would not be thinking about the innumerable traditional and indigenous communities that their minds would impact on. 
These are communities that live off the land, the water systems, the local vegetation, to provide them with food, medicines, building materials, shade trees, fuel, water. Um, because they depend on the land, they also care for it. Nor would these mining executives be seeing a world divided into nation states, with governments charged with stewardship of the nation's natural resources as part of the national patrimony. They would certainly not be thinking about citizens in these nation states who expect their governments to protect them and the environment from the dangers of mining. The citizens also expect their governments to establish tax and royalty regimes, assuming that the wealth created by mining should accrue not just to mining company directors and shareholders and a few in the national capital. They expect their governments to gain revenue from mining projects for education and transport and health systems for the needs not just of the current generation, but for future generations, maybe even seven generations. These are non-replenishable resources and can only be used once. It's highly likely that the mining companies would be thinking about the risks involved in their mining projects. Risk management is a major feature of mine management. And in fact, the mining industry retains Ernst & Young, a global finance company, to do an annual report on risks to the mining industry with quarterly updates on their website. Any of you can log on and, and have a look at it. Over the last dec decade, a risk always in the top 10, and for several years, number one, was what Ernst & Young called resource nationalism. So what does resource nationalism mean to the mining industry? Well, it seems to have four characteristics. The degree of state ownership of the natural resource. Taxes and royalties, number two. Number three, import and export taxes. And number four, mineral codes and regulations. And some even expand resource nationalism to include any stipulations a government might make that the mining company must create employment, use local raw materials, or contract local suppliers. So for the mining company, a government that has the temerity to establish a regime of taxes and royalties so that the wealth created by extracting the nation's natural resources becomes a source of revenue for government programs benefiting all citizens is seen as a risk. This means that virtually everything that probably most of us in this room think of as responsible mining is seen by the mining companies as a risk to be avoided, reduced, sidestepped, using any means necessary, legal or illegal. What is most striking is the mining industry's sense of entitlement. None of their understanding of these risks is hidden. Uh, it's freely shared on the Ernst & Young website and I think points to that central problem of the inordinate power and impunity of big mining in the world we live in today. And these words, regulatory capture, corporate capture, deep states, uh, really um, are, are what we're talking about. In this very room a few months ago, Kevin Taft, who is an elected member of the legislature, or was for many years in Alberta, um, talked about a new book he had written describing regulatory capture uh, in Alberta. He documented how the oil industry um, had managed to install in Alberta a narrative about mining so that political parties, universities, legislative assemblies, media, think tanks, and the courts, all the fundamental institutions of democracy, all of them had really been captured by the oil companies to the point that they now espouse the oil industry's vision of Alberta and its future. As a consequence, these vital institutions increasingly served the interests not of democracy, science, or the public, but the interests of the fossil fuel industry, especially the oil industry. Taft calls this oil's deep state. I question in the paper, is the mining industry succeeding in creating mining's deep state in British Columbia? And so surely, and I'll close with this, uh, um, surely neoliberalism's greatest victory is that they have managed to normalize a view of society in which the main social actor is the private entrepreneur and the role of government 
becomes that of providing the institutional context in which the private sector can prosper. There has been a reversal of roles which makes the corporate entrepreneurs and the market into the higher power and downsizes government from its governing and regulating role to a role of servicing the needs of business. And the kind of, so I'll, I'll stop there I, and look forward to, to uh, conversing with people uh, in terms of how, how uh, they see this. But I, I think both of these situations were dramatic in creating a world in which citizens could no longer depend on their governments to protect them in the face of the damages that big mining companies had caused. And so whether it's protecting workers, protecting communities, uh, protecting the salmon, uh, what do we do recognizing that our governments have lost the political will to do that and see it as appropriate to play a role in service of the corporations and how do we challenge um, that state of mining, um, which is hence the title of our, our conversations today about the state of mining. Thank you. We'll have Matt, who is a doctoral candidate in political science at York University. Okay. Thank you, Judith. Actually, your talk will segue very well with mine because I'd like to pursue this theme of regulatory capture. But I think, Judith, I'm going to push back a bit on the idea that at one time governments had this idea that their role was to regulate the mining companies in the interest of the public. So I'm going to start my presentation with a quote from the 1950s. Um, so the Ontario Mining Association, which is the main lobby for the big mining companies that operate in this province, they used to hold their annual receptions at a place called uh, Big Win Inn, which is a, lo a fancy lodge and resort in the Muskoka Lakes area. And they used to invite the Provincial Minister of Mines every year, and they'd ask him to give a speech, and uh, he'd usually say something about you know, all the good work that the mining industry was doing and developing the hinterland and bringing jobs and prosperity and development and all the rest of it. Um, so at one of these gatherings in 1954, the Minister of Mines at the time, his name was Philip Kelly, I think he was forced to resign in some scandal, but that's a different story. He finished his address by saying, I hope that I have been able to show you that we are extremely anxious to do everything that lies in our power to assist you as individuals or as corporate officials in the development of our mineral, mineral resources. You, after all, you, after all, are the people we work for. Collectively, you are the boss, and it is up to us to give you what you want if this is humanly possible. So, the basic point that I'd like to make today is that regulatory capture in Ontario has been an enduring feature of our mineral policy framework since uh, the industry emerged as a major force in the late 19th century. There really hasn't ever been a sustained period of time when the government has taken its regulatory role seriously. Apart from perhaps one could say the short period of time, 1985 to 1995, but even then it's debatable. So regulatory capture has meant that whenever a major policy conflict has pitted the mining industry against some other social force, so the workers movement, the environmental movement, indigenous peoples, the, the industry has always had its voice you know, directly at the cabinet table in, in the seat of power in government. So in my research, I, I'm doing my dissertation at York, I'm looking at the history of, I guess, regulatory capture. And it's been pretty shocking to go through the archival record, because you see that the mines department, the officials in the mines department have been so single-minded in their determination to protect the narrow interests of the industry, that they're just incapable of seeing any broader picture. So even if there's a conflict between, say, the logging industry and the mining industry, it's, the logging industry doesn't matter. So before I started my research, I thought, you know, it might be reasonable to think that these people had a broader conception of the public interest apart from what the industry wanted, but that really hasn't been the case. So, for example, when the acid rain battles were going on in the 1980s, I'm sure many of you remember that, and even rich, rich cottage owners, again, in the Muskoka Lakes area, they were starting to get worried about acid rain because it meant that, you know, the lakes were dying and they're fancy cottages were going to see a decline in the property values. 
But at that time, the, the Mines Department took it upon itself to write a, a lengthy report outlining how, how terrible it would be uh, if the Ontario government took regulatory action to limit sulfur dioxide emissions from the Inco smelter in Coppercliff near Sudbury. And so the basic case that, that, that they made in that report was that even though Inco at that time was the world's largest emitter of sulfur dioxide, it didn't make sense to put a regulatory program on Inco because even if they entirely eliminate their sulfur dioxide emissions, there'd be other sulfur dioxide emissions and acid rain would continue. So why bother with regulating Inco? That just happened to be Inco's position, and I think it's worth mentioning that was also more or less the position of the Ministry of the Environment. So the history of the way that Ontario has dealt with smelter pollution uh, in the Sudbury area and elsewhere is pretty remarkable, so I want to go through the history a bit there. At one time, there was uh, a thriving farming community near Sudbury, which is surprising to think about now, but it's true. So the first laws that were passed around smelter pollution uh, came into force during the First World War when nickel production, because they make, they mine nickel and stuff, right? Uh, it was breaking all sorts of records because the armament industry, right? So they were making, selling nickel to the armaments industry to fight the war. Uh, but back in the early 20th century, the ore smelting practices were even more ecologically destructive than they are today. And the companies used a process that's called open heap roasting. So that was, what was that? Okay, so that was piling up thousands and thousands of pounds of raw ore on top of logs that had been clear cut from the surrounding forest and lighting it on fire and then letting it burn for, at times, uh, up to six months in the open air with no chimney. And the biggest one that Inco had was two kilometers long. And since the roasting took place in the open air, there was, you know, as I said, no chimneys. That the, the, off gases, the toxic sulfur gases, just went wherever the wind took them. So naturally this generated a bit of conflict between the mining firms and the farmers. But the first law that the Ontario government passed didn't force the companies to you know, deal with the pollution. Instead, they passed the, the government passed a law that allowed the companies to buy what were called smoke easements from the farmers who suffered pollution damage. So for a one-time payment, the company would purchase the right to pollute and damage property in, in perpetuity. So even if, so say I'm a farmer who had a piece of land, I sold the smoke easement to Inco. If I then sold my land to someone else, that smoke easement would remain in force even though the other person you know, may, not, may not have wanted to sell the smoke mm -hmm. easement. But that law wasn't good enough because quite a few farmers didn't like the idea of selling smoke easements because they actually wanted to make a living you know, raising their crops. And lots of them even thought that the government should force the company to control the poison gases that they were spewing out. And there are actually, there are old newspaper articles from around the First World War, or during the First World War, showing that some Sudbury area residents complained that even though the British Army, British Army sorry, had just refrained from using sulfur gas as a chemical weapon against German troops, because it was banned by the Hague Convention, the Ontario government was taking no action against the mining companies who were releasing this stuff every day. But a few years after the First World War, the government passed a law that was even more permissive. And farmers, so farmers who hadn't sold smoke easements started suing the companies for damages. And, and they mostly, they lost all the, the cases. But then it seemed like the government, it seemed like the court might side with, might side with the farmers in this one case. So then at that point, the companies quietly approached the government behind closed doors and suggested it craft, it craft some legislation that would make it impossible uh, for lawsuits against the ore smelters to go to court. And the law that they passed was called the Damage by Fumes Arbitration Act, which is just a fantastic name, right? <laughs> and uh, a historian has just published a paper this past summer that showed that the Ontario, uh, yeah, the Ontario's Attorney General actually sent a draft copy of the legislation to INCO for editing. Uh, so INCO more or less wrote the law. Uh, so that law gave the, uh, a government appointed arbitrator the power to make awards for damages and whatever uh, amount he said was, you know, that was it. There was no appeals from his decisions and then you'd have no, rec no recourse to any other legal action. So for decades, for decades, the local farmers pressured the government to do something about the smelter pollution 
and get rid of this law. They said that the arbitrator was a creature of the company and he'd purposefully make small awards or he'd deny that the damage was from the smelters. He'd say, oh no, that's just, you don't know how to farm, something like that, you know? But the farmers would say, hey, look, um, the BC government has forced Coming Co., which was a zinc mining firm in BC, which also produced tons and tons of sulfur emissions, but the BC government had forced uh, that company to turn its sulfur emissions into sulfuric acid, so surely we could do something similar with Inco here, but the government never, the government said no. <laughs> so, but what was really remarkable about that whole thing is that the government knew that a technical fix was possible from the very earliest stages. In fact, in the early 1900s, there was a famous, he's a well-known industrialist from Sault Ste. Marie, his name was Francis Clerg, and he, he's known for setting up the Algoma steel factory there. He actually bought a nickel mine in Sudbury just for the purposes of converting the sulfur to sulfuric acid because he was running a pulp mill. He had approached Inco about this, but the company refused. And I learned that from the same uh, uh, historical piece that I read about the, uh, how Inco had crafted, more or less crafted this Damage by Fuchs Arbitration Act. And the speculation is that because Inco was connected to the Morgan interest, J.P. Morgan, who also controlled uh, the salt, uh, Texas Gulf Sulfur, which was the world's largest producer of sulfuric acid. The speculation is that they didn't want to flood the sulfuric acid market because it would undermine uh, Texas Gulf Sulfur's profits. Okay. Um, okay, but it wasn't just in turning a blind eye to pollution that the government helped Dinko. It also helped the company hold on to its nickel monopoly. When the, comp when the American government was trying to break it, it up using its antitrust legislation in the 1940s. So not long after an antitrust suit was launched against Dinko because it controlled something like 90% of the U.S. nickel market. Ontario passed a law that's that was called the Business Records Protection Act, which made it illegal for firms based in Ontario to share documents with foreign governments or courts. So because the antitrust proceedings couldn't get a hold of the documents that they needed to make their case, the whole thing fizzled out. Um, when it comes to worker health and safety, the mines department was just as biased in favor of the mining companies. So in the 1950s, when Ontario, when their uranium mines first opened in Ontario, uh, quite a number of them opened without, or started production without even having um, functioning ventilation systems in place. When the province was considering passing laws around workers' exposure to silica for the very first time in the 19, late 1970s, up until that time there was no law, the Mines Department took it upon itself to fight against the regulations, and some of the department's officials even wrote letters to the companies advising them on how to make the most impact, impactful submissions to the cabinet to make sure that the regulations wouldn't come into force. Um, that effort was successful and the, the proposed leg legislation or regulation, sorry, was significantly weakened. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind of that I think that the mining industry has never actually been able to overcome the problem of occupational illness. So while it's true that uh, accidents are way down, uh, the number of industrial or occupational diseases are not. So the most recent study came out in 2014 between 2004 and 2014 in Ontario, the WSIB accepted 171 claims uh, from occupational death related to mining. So that's about 17 mine workers a year. It's uh, hard to say. I think I'm, I'm, I just want to talk about one more thing. That's all right. Remember, we're giving you some extra okay. advice. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I just want to talk about one more thing. I want to talk a bit about the mining tax. <laughs> because, in my opinion, and I think I can convince you of this, the Ontario public gets next to nothing for, from the sale of its uh, non-renewable natural resources. Basically because the mining tax is structured in such a way as to create legal loopholes for the companies to lower their tax bill. So one example of this is exploration and development costs. So those are the costs that you know, are associated with going out and finding mines and then building new mines. Those costs can be carried forward permanently and indefinitely, so to regulate your future tax payments. 
So it usually takes a few years for a mine to pay off its initial costs and then start turning a profit. But as soon as that happens in Ontario, you can say, well, you could just you know, shift some numbers around here and there, and then when it comes for tax purposes, you don't have any profit. So I was going to show you a, I did some research on each of the individual gold mining companies and their tax payments using the federal government's new extractive sector transparency measure act, it's a mouthful, ESTMA. But they're all online, so any company that operates a mining up, any mining company that has any sort of function here in Canada, it doesn't have to necessarily mine here, but if it has an office here, it has to report its payments to governments around the world. And so I looked at those and I looked at the, um, there were nine, yeah, nine gold mining companies, or no, eight. Three of them paid tax, five of them didn't. And then uh, of the total $3 billion worth of gold that was produced in Ontario in 2016, there was a total of just over $17 million in tax payments, so that would be, and it doesn't distinguish between corporate income tax and mining tax, but in any event, that's only 0.6% of the gold revenues that were extracted from Ontario went back to the public purse. And that's not uh, cherry picking, that's pretty yeah. typical. Um, so on that note, I think I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Last step, but uh, certainly not least, will be Joe Kuyak. Kuyak? Kuyak. Kuyak? Kuyak. Never mind. Kuyak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is among the founders of Mining Watch. Uh, I think uh, the most important uh, uh, institution that monitors mining, Canadian mining abroad. Well, here it's the only yeah. one. Appreciate okay. that. Joe? Yeah. Well, I'm writing a book. It's actually okay. for publishers now about mining in Canada. And it, between the lines, we'll be publishing it next year sometime. So I just let you know that. Um, What's the title? Putting Mining in Its Place Mining in Community Resistance in Canada. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to sort of tell you a story, I think. Um, a couple of stories to pull this together. And the first one is to talk to you a little bit about the ongoing role of colonialism and mining. Um, <clears throat> I lived in Sudbury for 30 years, so the I had a smoke easement on my property. I think almost everybody does. And uh, when people's cars would get damaged, um, you had 24 hours to report it to the company in order to to get restitution for this. And there would be regular inversions that would sort of burn your garden or burn your car or, or something. But 24 hours is pretty tight, right? Especially if it's damaged to plants. And if you didn't get the, co the complaint in within 24 hours, it was summarily dismissed. There might have been ways to get around that, but I never found it. Um, it I was at a, a meeting this weekend um, where people from northern Ontario, from the area where the Ring of Fire is being developed, uh, were telling their story. And I've been following the Ring of Fire project maybe for 10 years. How many of you know about the Ring of Fire? Oh, almost all of you, which that's wonderful. Um, the area where this project is planned is uh, Muskeg. It's fairly pristine. Um, there's small communities up there that have been devastated as most indigenous communities have by displacement, dispossession, and impoverishment over the years. Um, the meeting I was in, uh, the chief of uh, Yava, uh, uh, sorry, of Nishkanaga First Nation had to leave in the middle of it because their reverse osmosis water system had frozen and there was no alternative. I was sort of sh I remember being kind of shocked that they actually had to depend on a water treatment system because they live in the midst of pristine muskeg. But the result of not having adequate sewer systems and other things means that the water that they draw from is now contaminated with sewage. Um, there's a number of communities that are in the area of the Ring of Fire, and they have been living a fairly traditional lifestyle, largely able to live off of uh, country foods. They depend on, on moose and uh, beaver and, uh, and fish from the area. 
Um, nearby, there's another set of communities around Kitchimixic and Inuit, KI, which uh, managed to fight off a project uh, about 10 years ago now um, of a company named Platinix. And they have been able to reclaim an awful lot of how they govern themselves. And they threw out the northern stores, for example, and ran it with a cooperative. They have um, a number of really good structures in place to protect their water and land now. And for the people in the Ring of Fire area, which is this huge deposit, as you know, that's shaped like a backward C, um, they have, they have not had that opportunity to get together, to work together, and so on, and, and have found it very difficult to, to try and organize to protect those things that they love and cherish from the onslaught of this project. Um, a number of years ago now, they managed to get a framework agreement with the province that would protect, would allow them to have their own environmental assessment in which they would take charge they would evaluate those things they love that they need for their survival and to build their own process for deciding if this project should go ahead. And what the company has done over that time and, um, is to work with the Ontario government to destroy that relationship they have with each other, to further impoverish them, to, use, um, to control the, all the discourse over the ring of fire, and to make sure that these people have no way protecting themselves. They continue, they, nevertheless, they persist. <laughs> they, they continue to try and, and fight for uh, more information, for some control over what's happening to them, and quite frankly, to block this project if they possibly can. I spent a lot of time looking at the Ring of Fire, and one of the things I realized quite early on was that the company, Noron, which actually is a Sudbury-based bunch of um, junior miners, um, has no money. It's like all junior mining companies. It's a spending machine. And at this point, their biggest set of shares are held, 20, almost 20% of their shares are held by Resource Capital Corporation, which is a Toronto-based bunch of speculators. They speculate particularly in mining. Resource Capital has also loaned them, I think it's 29, don't, my memory for numbers is a bit vague, so don't quote me on the numbers, but I think it's $29 million, a loan that's um, based on 8% compounded quarterly. So it's kind of, it's, I mean, you don't give a loan like that to some something that's going to produce anything very fast. And they, so their ownership of that company, they've been being paid off in shares every time the loan comes due and then they renew it. So slowly they're controlling all of Norant. Um, the other big loan that they have, the one that enabled them to buy Cliffs Natural Resources, Cliffs is the big company that, from the States, a coal company, coal and iron producer company, that was going to develop the Ring of Fire. You remember the whole bump of that? They sold that huge project is supposedly worth $60 billion, according to Tony Clement, such a trustworthy source. Um, they sold it for $22 million to Norman in the middle of a feasibility study that was supposed to show that it was worth mining the chromate. And I think that timing is really significant. And the money came from Franklin, Nevada, which is Frank Juster's operation. It's a major capitalist mining investor. They don't build mines, they speculate on mines and they buy, settle streaming agreements with companies for gold bought at a lower price, silver bought at a lower price, so in the long term project. So in fact, Noron is, Alan Coots and those guys are really in thrall at this point to Resource Capital Corporation and, and Franco Nevada and so the power that's speaking to the Ontario government and trying to dominate these little communities is, is big, well-connected, and probably... I, well, what I've been trying to figure out is if the amount that they've put into these companies is, much, is a big investment for them. I haven't really been able to track that. I don't think it is. These are billion, you know, these companies have trillions of dollars in wealth. So I don't think $25 million means a lot to them. But it might. I don't know that. Um, 
So if any of you have clues about it, I'd appreciate it very much, and I think the communities would. But these brave people from these communities, um, Yabatong had 125 deaths between January and November, beginning of November this year. Suicides, drug overdoses from oxycodone, elders dying, people dying of diabetes complications. They live in a state of incredible dispossession and grief. And they're being forced, you know what the Ontario government pays for there besides minimal health care and education? A mining advisor. In all those communities, in Nishnabi Aski Nation, they pay for a mining advisor to help the community understand and grapple with taking advantage of the ring of fire, which is going to happen sometime. A number, about almost 10 years ago, they sent a whole bunch of young people on mining training in Thunder Bay so that they would be ready when the project started. They're going to be old people if that ever happens at all. They can't mine the chromite unless they can process it into ferrochrome. And in order to process it into ferrochrome, they have to get it from these communities, 600 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. Bring it down, stick it on a road or stick it on rail, and get it to a ferrochrome smelter. There are no ferrochrome smelters in North America. And there are no ferrochrome smelters in North America because they are so polluting and they are, their electrical costs are so incredibly high. It is important to know that the ferrochrome, the major producer of ferrochrome is in fact Glencore in South Africa and in Kazakhstan. And they're the major mining company with the smelters, one of the two major mining companies in Sudbury. One wonders why they're not more interested in the Ring of Fire. So there's a whole set of questions around these ferrochrome smelters, which produce as a byproduct huge amounts of chromium-6, which is very dangerous. It's the thing that Aaron Brockovich was dealing with in the film. Um, there are ways of dealing with it, but they're very expensive and difficult. And they, they use huge amounts of electricity. They have to heat um, the chrome um, to over 4,000 degrees. So they require huge amounts of electricity. And Coots has been on record as saying that they can't build the smelter unless they have an agreement with the Ontario government to give them um, electricity at five cents per kilowatt. But it's like, I think about an eighth of what all of us pay for electricity. So you're not just talking about a billion dollar or more subsidy, which probably is doubled by now, because that's an estimate from five, six years ago. A, million, a billion dollars or more for a road or rail up to the site, but they have to, um, they process it. They have to process it and then subsidize the electricity, not to mention dealing with whatever problems there are. The mines are likely, if they're ever built, to uh, create serious methyl mercury poisoning in the Attawapiskat and Albany rivers. The Victor Diamond Mine that is north of there on the Attawapiskat River does produce um, serious quantities of methyl mercury, which has been documented by Wildlands League and others. Um, but that mine is now shut down, of course. The diamond mine no longer operates, and De Beers had it owned by a subsidiary, so we don't know whether anything will be done about the methylmercury that's in the water right now. And I think what the other story I want to tell you is about a meeting I went to last week, which was Canada's new minerals and metals plan. And it was a meeting with NGOs like Mining Watch to discuss how they are going to position Canadian mining as the major industry in Canada. This is being done, of course, by Natural Resources Canada, as, and as Matt says, they've always, they were the Ministry of Mines. Their job is to promote mining. They're really the, the public relations arm of the mining industry. That's what they do. And, and they, they have this whole new glossy plan, and they've been consulting. And consulting means generally that you, you waste an afternoon sitting there with people and, and they talk, at, they give you a dog and pony show glossy presentation. And we, um, 
we sat there and listened for some of it. it there's nothing that makes you feel more powerless than being in, a, in an industry presentation through the mouths of government that acts as though there's no other way to look at the world. And I, I mean, I've known, I've been struggling against mining companies for over 50 years, and when I, I sit there and I, I'm feeling powerless, I thought, this is really good. You know, they do this really well. They're talking about new subsidies, they're talking about sustainable mining and green mining, which really means lithium mining, graphite mining, uh, rare earth metals, and uh, promoting this kind of stuff. Um, there is not a word not a word about the mounting amounts of mining waste. Mining is, in fact, a waste management industry. That's what it is. So when you have an ore that's 0.21% copper, that's of the ore body. The rest of it is waste rock, tailings, effluents, sludge from the water treatment plant. It's more than 100% of what's taken out of the ground, and it's got to be managed forever in perpetuity is the phrase they use, which means that my great-great-great-grandchildren are going to be dealing with the over 5,000 hectares of tailings at, at, from Inco and uh, 4,000 hectares from Falconbridge and the 3,000 hectares up by the Lockerbie site held back by dams forever. This isn't allowed for, you know. We can't even look after the pyramids. That's the thing we know that's lasted that long, mm -hmm. and they're a mess. So the kind of um, spin that they give us omits that. It omits, it externalizes every single one of the things that matter. The lives of the people in Ishkanag and Yavatung. The people who were in Sudbury before the mine happened and are still there, the Anakam Anishinaabek who in fact at one point launched a lawsuit for $600 billion against uh, federal and provincial governments, mm -hmm. which they said was their share of what had been taken out of that area over the 100 years they've been there. It externalizes all the ongoing costs to water, to the wildlife, to the contributions to climate change. Those all become things that you put a line in the, they, were, they wanted to consult with NGOs so they could put a line in the document about taking care of the environment. And they said, they told us they hadn't put anything in because they put environment and community together at the beginning and somehow they couldn't figure out how to phrase it. I think it was close <laughs> to what they said. It was, it was an insulting and, and terrible violation. And I've got to say, people fought back hard. I mean, people really did yeah. speak back very hard. Can I ask how many engineers were there? Well, there was 15 there. 50. Yeah, and Mining Watch had helped, you know, facilitated a lot of this. But, you know, you're there for a few hours. They're talking to the industry every day. <laughs> and, and there was these kids that they'd hired. I should, well, they may not be kids. I'm an old lady, so everybody looks like a kid. But they were, they were very young. They knew nothing about mining. They were there because they had other kinds of skills. And, and they, they want to love their job. They want to believe in their job, mm -hmm. right? So they'll make things up when they don't know. And a couple of them came up to me afterwards and were really upset. They said, we didn't know any of this. And I said, well, there's a time in your life when you have to make a choice between what you do with your working hours and whether you really need the job that badly and what you can do with it. I understand where you're at. Because I lived in Sudbury for so long, many, many of my friends are minors. You know, they, one of my better friends um, was a mining engineer that built a model mine for a mining supply services sector group. He's really proud of this mine because it's really hard to do it. You know, building an underground mine is really complicated and difficult work. And Eric was just so happy about this. And he spent his life doing it. I mean, supported his family, supported a lot of extra relatives, took care of, you know, things. And people. I guess I'm going to end there because there's one other thing I want to say that there was an elder that was, I was very close to in Sudbury, Art, well, elders, Art and Eva Solomon, and Art had worked for Ontario Hydro for a number of years and, and started uh, the Native Craft Association. He was, he, um, he was part of AIM, he was part of the, uh, the 
uh, indigenous movement that was considered the most militant candidate when, when Eva American died. The American Indian movement. The American yeah. Indian movement. And when Eva died, the AIM drum came drum for it, which is really something. But Art said to me, well, just before he died, he said, well, tell him about the wage slave economy, Joan. That's what you got to do. So I'm telling you about it. And I, you know, in mining, mining which always said that miners, mining companies aren't miners, and it's true. The people who run and own these companies have a totally different set of interests than the people who work for them. And the people who work for them um, want, want good things too. They suffer too in the, from the, the pollution and the industrial disease and the white hand and the heart, the loss of hearing. And they've lost their kids. If you ran more in my asbestos, you probably lost your wife. Um, and they're desperate for jobs. And the only way we get around this and the only way we're going to be able to change things is if we can create other ways for people to earn their livings and other ways of building our economy. We don't need more gold. We don't need more diamonds. We don't need uranium and we don't need coal. Those are sort of the, almost the key pillars of the Canadian economy. And unless we start looking at other ways to, um, to create our economy and to build it on the basis of the kind of closed loop systems and, and more sustainable ways of doing things, unless we start listening to people who tell us about other ways to build infrastructure so we don't have to be constantly ripping things from the earth to do it, we could be recycled. There's almost nobody working in Canada on recycling metals. We could be remining tailings, we could be recycling metals, we can be mining landfills for copper. I mean, that's all there. But we have to get control of the discourse and we have to reconnect with other ways of doing things. And unless we build those links between fighting mining companies and building alternative economies, I don't think we've got a hope. But the earth is calling out for it, and so are all those indigenous people who are still resisting and trying to make things better. And I'm going to just stop there. Okay. Thank you.